Well, thank you very much, um, Amara, for inviting me to join the group today. Um, I'm not uh, an antiquarian or even really a historian, um, but thank you for having me along. I hope um, this research that I've been doing with Elsa is of interest. It's still, I would say, a fairly early stage compared to some of the panellists today, um, but I think it's an amazing uh, story um, and I'm excited to share it with you. So thank you very much. Um, the talk uh, I'm going to give today is part of some research I've been doing with my friend Elsa Munro about Hartley Ramsden and Margot Eats. Margot and Hartley were two curators and critics whose lives span most of the 20th century, and they were active in London from the 1920s to the 1990s. The full research draws on recent work in geography, actually, by authors such as David Matlis, Hayden Lorimer, Felix Driver and others, that seeks to sort of blur the boundaries between biography and historical geography, and it also offers an examination of the often invisible work of female cultural intermediaries and of the disruption of gendered and spatialised work-related work -related subjectivities in the mid-20th century. The paper is also a meditation on love, about what love means, what love does, and how we might think of love geographically as spatial, relational and political. Today I will focus on one piece of work that Margot undertook in her long and varied career, the management of the London Museum at Lancaster House around the corner during the Second World War. In this talk I will outline the context of her of the museum in the in war the, the talk will outline the context of the museum in wartime, discuss the responsibilities that Margot had, point to her position in the network of women who shaped museum work during the Second World War, and explore the influence of her relationship with Hartley Ramsden. It aims to be an intersectional look at its identity as a woman of colour who loved women, and the creative and generative effects that this had on her work and the city around her. Margot Eats, pictured here as a baby, was born in 1913 to Louise Eats, um, who I, I wrote, when I wrote this I said was a notable suffragist activist but as of last week, English Heritage actually turned down uh, my proposal for her to get a blue plaque, so she's not on the grounds of her not being high profile enough, uh, which left me thinking, if only there was some scheme to raise people's profiles. <laughs> um, but no, do, uh, do look up the work of Louis Eats. Um, uh, I shall continue to uh, pester, or, or shall I say agitate, probably. Anyway, and, uh, and Dr Eats, a GP. Uh, she met Hartley Ramsden when she was a young woman, uh, when she was employed to meet Hartley Ancient Greek. She would later work with Tessa and Mortimer Wheeler on the main Castle Hillfall excavation in Dorset, which, as many of you will know, is a huge project co-directed by Tessa Wheeler and her husband Mortimer Wheeler. And um, the excavation ran for four seasons, with around 100 staff each season. Uh, Margot was involved in managing press and inducting new members of the team, she worked on the excavation with a team that included several notable women archaeologists whose names I'll probably now mispronounce, Veronica Seton-Williams, Joan de Platt taylor Rachel Maxwell Hislop, Marlene Collingwich and Beatrice de Cardi. Margot was soon also working at the London Museum, where she would become acting keeper during the Second World War. During the war, she organised both the removal and safe storage of the collections, and she also put on a remarkable exhibition of contemporary art. Today I'm going to focus on one part of the research we've been carrying out which concerns the exhibition New Movements in Art and while it reflects a little bit on how Margot's relationship with Hartley underpinned it. Margot and Hartley met as young women in 1930 and they spent basically the rest of their lives together. They lived and worked together throughout their lives and the romantic loving relationship was at times sexual as Margot's papers record. In 1932, Margot wrote that she wished I would share my love with the whole world if I could. The happiness it gives me is supreme. Um, Hartley was given the name Eileen at birth, but used the name Hartley from the 1930s. In her younger years, Hartley's look, which included wearing her hair cropped and, trousers and wearing trousers and suits, coincided with popular fashions for young women, although her commitment to this look outlasted the trends by many decades. Hartley was referred to as Miss Ramsden and with female pronouns throughout her life and after her death. Uh, but on at least one occasion, it looks like she referred to herself as son. 
Margot certainly identified as being attracted to women and obviously considered Hartley a woman. Uh, but like Hartley's friends and peers, we use female pronouns throughout our research, but we continue to search for Hartley's own preference, which is actually quite difficult to unpick um, throughout a century where gendered language was used so frequently. Um, thinking of phrases like dear sirs, gentlemanly criticism, and the kind of praise uh, that Joe mentioned earlier, um, and so on. Margot began work at the London Museum, which was open um, within Lancaster House, in 1937 as a part-time lecturer. It was a transformational time for the museum. Morton Wheeler was the museum's keeper, and he and Tessa were keen to professionalise the organisation, which uh, had to be turned, they said, from a junk shop into a tolerably rational institution, a uh, phrase which, working at the Transport Museum, a sort of rival school for the uh, Museum of London, gives me great pleasure to say. Um, the Wheelers recruited more women, as well as Margot, we point Beatrice de Cardi and um, Thalassa Crusoe, who we heard about earlier and saw uh, in, where in the collection. Interesting. Um, lectures for school children and adults and one of the museum's priorities, and Margot delivered these. She would later appear on the BBC soon after her beginning work at the London Museum as she presented some of the first examples of TV archaeology, which Sarah Perry's researchers examined in more detail. The London Museum, um, especially in the couple of years following Tessa's death, seems a very strange and quite toxic working environment to my eyes as I read about it today. Margot was a source for Hawke's biography of Mortimer Wheeler, and the stories about how he touched, harassed and bullied the women who worked there were really unpleasant to read if not entirely unfamiliar to readers today, despite Hawke's more, um, less critical attitude, perhaps. The museum's four male senior staff left for military service in 1939. Before he left for his posting in North Africa, Mortimer Wheeler divided the collection into three categories with Margot's help. Um, objects to be stored underground at Dover Street Station, uh, helpfully on this uh, Transport Museum poster. Um, objects like costumes, uh, which uh, the last would have worked with, to be stored at the country house in Buckinghamshire, and other objects to be stored in the reinforced basement of Lancaster House. Um, as acting keeper, Margot oversaw the movement of the collection for safekeeping in September 1939. Hartley was clearly working in and around the museum on an informal basis throughout this period and managed to record her amusement at the process. In a poem entitled, The Museum is in Course of Disarrangement, a true and accurate account of the packing at Lancaster House. Um, Hartley scathingly mocked the museum's collections, um, but though her, her lengthy description of material suggests she spent a great deal of time at work with Margaret, because you can, um, I don't know if you can make out the text there, uh, but it refers to objects um, like the paper flowers and the painted farthings and things like that, which you can still see in the Museum of London's collection today. Um, so she must have been kicking around the office plenty. Um, we can only wonder what the atmosphere was like in the museum at that time, amongst the women left running and reporting um, on the organisations we'd have left behind. This period also saw the organisation of the Institute of Archaeology, and in her recent paper, Katie Maho notes that Margot helped Wheeler to keep up with Kathleen Kenyon's activities on the sly. They exchanged correspondence while he was in India about Kenyon and the Institute. It's easy to imagine that Margot provided comparable reports on her colleagues at the London Museum. Um, in particular, the relationship between Beatrice Ducardi and Eats was not an easy one. We know that Beatrice Ducardi disliked Margot intensely, partly, I believe, for her ethnicity, and did, had done for some time uh, and maintain this opinion th um, uh, throughout her life. In a revealing oral history recorded in 2012, Ducardi recounts how she had hated Margot on sight, describing her as an Anglo-Indian with a mustardy coloured complexion, heavily made up and stout. Lancaster House was first bomb damaged in 1940. During that year, Margot and Beatrice continued to give lectures maintaining the museum's focus on everything which could be collected of the historic interest connected with London from the earliest times. In 1941, um, the Lancaster House was bomb damaged again. The museum was closed. Ducardi was seconded to the Foreign Office. Hartley took up the role of the museum assistant, museum's assistant, working with Eats, and Ducardi resented this appointment, I believe, till the end of her life, as she reflects on it in that 2012 interview. With a damaged building, almost all its clerical staff elsewhere, and the museum's collection stored out of sight, 
The controlling and ordering processes of the museum were disrupted. Alongside these forces, Hartley's influence on the activities um, the, of the museum were growing with her, alongside her professional employment. From 1941, Margot and Hartley had been in regular contact with the artist Paul Nash concerning an article Hartley was writing. In January 1942, Eats wrote to Nash outlining Ramsden's ambitious idea to host an exhibition of contemporary art at the London Museum, and this bit terrifies me, in March. So that's like a two and a half month turnaround for a major exhibition. I hope uh, my directors never hear of that scale. Um, the exhibition, New Movements in Art, not only reopened the museum, but represented a significant break um, with the museum's focus on London. The exhibition emerged from the shared relationships, contacts and network of Margot and Harley, from the balance of their personalities and manners. In all the years of the London Museum, and even through to the subsequent Museum of London, no exhibition like this has ever been attempted, let alone delivered, again. The exhibition featured work produced in England from 1937 onwards, uh, so about five, four and a bit years. Many of the artists selected formed part of the St Ives School, Nash, Barbara Hepworth, Ben Nicholson, Nam Garbo, whoever's others like Pierre Montrian, were included because they had pitched up in England in light of imminent war in Europe. Some of the pieces were retrieved from galleries and private collections in London and St Ives, but many were loaned by the artists themselves. Lancaster House was reopened on 17th of March 1942 for the private view of new movements, opening up the space in both a pragmatic and an imaginative sense. Margot and Hartley juxtaposed the solid, staid Victorian interior of the museum with contrasting surrealist and constructivist works that highlighted the radical nature of the new movements project. Nam, Gar Nam Garbo's sorry, del delicate kinetic sculptures must at the time have looked wonderfully alien amongst, uh, amongst the museum's columns and high ceilings. Garbo himself was delighted and surprised with the exhibition, writing about the wonderful response his work received from the 10,000 visitors who saw it, the, saw it during the museum's March to May run. The juxtaposition wasn't always so successful, and the new statesman notes that against the interior, Mondrian's designs look lifeless and reminiscent of a strip of, li strip of lino in a suburban bathroom. However, the new statement, new statement also noted that Nash's serpents in the woodpile, um, shown here, was startling in pale shades of pink and blue. And John Tunnard's landscapes are singled out for their rich, warm colours. In Hartley's foreword to the exhibition, she noted that new movements is in every sense new, referring to the museum and its traditional remit, to the chaos of the war that closed Lancaster House and the innovations in practice and techniques that the artists embodied. The exhibition was well received, with the New Statesman praising it as a commendable enterprise. The News Review wrote of the importance of such a challenging, but above all optimistic, exhibition during wartime, and Country Life noted the strange transpositions that resulted from the absence of preoccupation of museum's male directors, in placing Margot and Hartley's work on new movements within a broader trajectory of female-led change in museum's um, priorities and practice. However, what the exhibition catalogue and critics' reviews can't show is how reliant the success of the exhibition was on Margot and Hartley's relationship. The correspondence, be correspondence between Margot and Hartley that at the risk of being redacted, Margot brought warmth, wit and passion, whereas Hartley could be inflexible, high-minded and sometimes a little bit difficult. Taking the correspondence with Paul and Margaret Nash as being both exemplary and unique, we can see how complementary their synergy could be. Margot undertaking emotional labour writing to invite the Nashes to drink our drinks, cajoling a call to lend artworks, apologising for Hartley for getting to write, smoothing over tensions within the hothouse of St Ives, and Hartley providing professional exposure. Although her correspondence with um, Paul and Margaret Nash was warm and affectionate, she did appear to have more of a concern with posterity, and building up a corpus of critical writing on the new movement of art they were all living through. The relative invisibility of Margot's emotional labour in the story of modernist art drew um, Elsa and I to her in the first instance, and it's the historical and contem contemporaneous devaluing of this labour that makes her dif um, legacy difficult to discern. Hartley is in some ways easier to trace, because she's left a significant body of writing. But it's possible that without Margot, she may never have gained, or probably maintained, access to this circle of artists that she needed. We know that even within the relatively open art museum scene, female homosexuality was still treated with contempt at this time. 
Um, a stenographer at the National Gallery, obviously just down the road, believed that she was dismissed due to prejudice regarding her emotional makeup as an invert, contemporary phrasing, uh, phrasing that denoted um, female homosexuality. Margot and Hartley were also uh, were responsible for keeping the museum open until November 1943, when the government took over Lancaster House and the last of the collections were shipped out. In part, they were able to do this by virtue of their tenacity and the fact they were both extremely well-respected and well-connected. But Margot and Hartley's engagement with the museum space can be read in another way, as an extension of their domestic life and of their relationship. At the time, it was not unheard of for keepers and museum staff to live on site, did the Wheelers briefly had done, and Ducardi also claimed to. But Margot and Hartley didn't live at the museum, London Museum or claim to. During part, due in part to the difficulties of securing a mortgage at the time as a same-sex couple, the pair lived in Acton, West London, with Margot's parents for a time. So for them, the museum became a place to host drinks parties and to meet with colleagues and friends who were integral to the functioning of the London art scene. From Margot's descriptions of these parties and the correspondence between Margot, Hartley and others, we can suggest their parties at the museum functioned as a sort of liminal space where the relatively closed nature of the institution was mobilised in order to create something more like a safe space. It's also worth noting here that the treatment of gay men at this period was also very different, and I'll pause here to acknowledge that Margot's religious conviction was partly expressed in her younger years through homo homophobic remarks in her papers. In the mid-20th century, criminalisation and entrapment ended the careers of Margot and Hartley's male gay peers, for instance, Trevor, Trevor, Trevor Thomas, excuse me, the curator who presented new movements in art in Leicester after it closed in London. Uh, Pink News reported that in Leicester's liberal circles it was known and privately accepted that Thomas was gay. His downfall therefore came as a shock. Um, an allegation that he and a young man had looked towards each other in a suspicious way in a public laboratory brought him before the city magistrate. He was subjected to a tirade from the bench, bound over to keep the peace and thrown in a cell. This treatment which effectively finished his career in the UK as he came out of the magistrate's court, he received his dismissal notice from the assistant town clerk on the steps of the town hall. In this context, Margot and Hartley spent a great deal of time and energy maintaining the appearance of their relationship. In the archives, there are traces of significant efforts to anticipate, mitigate and narrate their relationship in the minds of those around them, between themselves and on occasion for posterity. Letters reveal discussion of whether other people will understand their identities, and Margot even wrote an extensive and detailed unpublished defence of her sexuality and relationship with Hartley, which is now in the Tate archive. It was in this document that she outlined the full nature of their sexual relationship and declared her desire to tell the world of their relationship and to live openly. Through these efforts, Margot and Hartley appear to have suffered less um, unfair treatment and criminalisation than some of their peers were subject to. Even without evidence of unfair dismissal or criminal proceedings, we know they were subject to homophobic um, abuse and attitudes. Um, Ducardi accuses Margot of installing Hartley. She says she installed her lesbian lover in Ducardi's old job after she was seconded away. Um, and we must understand that the word lesbian here was a loaded term at that time. The moment of opportunity passed as the war came towards its, towards its end. A new male keeper was appointed to the London Museum, and in late, 95, late 1945, the male staff returned. Soon, Hartley and Margot moved on too. Margot wrote the first chronicle of Paul Nash's work after his death in 1946, and Hartley acted as an editorial consultant on Paul Nash's partly completed autobiography, wrote on 20th century sculpture, and learned classical Italian in order to translate Michelangelo's letters. Margot's departure from archaeology coincided with a huge number of women leaving the field. Perhaps her interest in archaeology waned or passed. Perhaps she preferred the interests that aligned more closely with Hartley's passions for art. Perhaps the passing of Nash and the reshaping of the art scene lent urgency to art writing and she prioritised that above archaeology. Perhaps Ducardi's growing eminence in archaeology acted as a deterrent. It's very hard to know whether she left the field of her own volition or whether the discipline shifted around her and pushed her away. Margot remained in touch with many of her archaeologists' network till the very end of her life. Although it continues to bemuse me that Margot was never particularly interested in London. Of, um, I don't know, it was my, my passion. 
Um, Margot and Hartley went on to long careers, publishing criticism and art history, and for a short time they edited a journal together. Uh, Margot and Hartley produced a TV programme adapted from Hartley's research and informed by Margot's early experience of archaeology on TV. Since their deaths, their papers have gone to the Tate Archive, where they are kept together as the Margot Eats and Hartley Ramsden Archive Collection. In many ways, they are incidental figures in the history of art and criticism in the 20th century. This is a small story, as Lorimer might put it, and yet it suggests so much about queer lives, museum work, collaboration and relationships. However, the Tate Collection is a testament to two lives lived together and to the generative and disruptive power of Hartley and Margot's relationship. Kerry Ann Morrison et al have written in their recent exploration of critical geographies of love that people are not distinct selves and loving is not just about merging or blending. It is always already relational and inseparable. I think anticipating this sort of statement, Neil McGregor, who was a friend of the couple in the 90s, wrote to Margot after Hartley's death, noting everything Hartley managed to do was, in a sense, done by you both. So much museum work relies on networks, relationships, friendship and support, as in fact this research depends on Elsa's friendship, encouragement, support and research. The London Museum was a site that helped sustain Margot and Hartley's relationship, offering space, work, employment, connections and contacts. And in turn, their relationship sustained the museum. Their shared interest prompting an exhibition project that reopened the museum after bomb damage, providing somewhere for 10,000 people to visit in six or seven short weeks. Um, one of the archive boxes contains Margot's poems, and I'll wrap up with one of these. Um, we've come home at length through all the world of thought here to each other's side. Quiet now, within the stillness of our transcending passion, shall we lie together in the hand of God. Hartley, being Hartley, expresses it differently in the, acknowledge in the acknowledgements of her book of translations of Michelangelo's letters, which she dedicated to Margot, for Margot always with gratitude. But what, in conclusion, can I say to my devil's advocate, Margot eats for so much and so much? That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.